Welcome to 3ABN's Fall Camp Meeting, Homecoming 2018. Featuring inspired messages from your 3ABN family. And featured speaker, Ty Gibson. All to prepare your heart for the coming of the Lord. Hello and welcome to 3ABN's Fall Camp Meeting. We are so glad that you have joined us here for our local audience, for you at home. Maybe you're listening on the radio. I'm going to ask for a hearty amen here. How many of you have been blessed so far? I know that I've been blessed, and it's a privilege for each one of us here at 3ABN to meet each one of you. Some of you have been here many times, and it's like family getting together. Some of you, I asked just before we went live, how many have been here for the first time, and the number of hands went up. So I told them, make sure this is not your last. Come again. So we are just so blessed here uh, to be enjoying camp meeting together. For those of you that were here Tuesday, which is way before camp meeting started, we had uh, here at 3ABN at our house, we had three and a half inches of rain in a very short period of time. Do you know what my cell phone said when it was just raining like crazy? It said light rain in Thompsonville. We were walking into work, and I was literally drowned. Well, not literally drowned, almost. I was soaking wet. What it reminded me of is that technology has its flaws, right? I mean, but on God's word, we have no need to fear. We can stand on these promises, can't we? Praise the Lord, we have nothing to fear. And we've been blessed so far with powerful messages. And again tonight, we have uh, Pastor Ty Gibson, and his message is the covenant fulfilled in Christ. But before that, we're going to be blessed with music by Ryan Day, Pastor Ryan Day. You've been blessed, haven't you? He has a talent from the Lord, and what a privilege it is to be able to serve with him, he and his wife, and that we are blessed to have them here. So, uh, Pastor Ryan, please bless us. I 
remember then how well you know the way I'll put my hand in your hand like a trusting child would do then say Let your spirit light my way, gentle Savior, lead me on, hold me close, keep me sane, lead me on, gentle everybody. Good evening, everybody else. <laughs> well, this evening, the message is best served by being vulnerable with you for a moment. Um, I once fell deeply in love with a woman by the name of Kelly Johnson. The moment I laid eyes on her, I knew that we were meant to be together forever, and I couldn't even imagine living another day without her. Problem was, she was 23 and I was seven. <laughs> and she, for some reason, didn't think we were a good match. I spent a whole lot of time carving our names in close proximity into the tree outside of her house. I waited there for her to come out of the house and see it, and she did. She looked at it, and she smiled, and she said, Aw, that's cute, little guy. <laughs> cute. I was looking for maybe the word romantic or awesome or something like cute. She patted me on the head, patted me on the head, and she giggled, and I was devastated. Something happened in that moment inside of me. Something immature, but something that has the potential to grow into something mature. Fast forward with me. As a teenage boy, my mother, my young mother, sat on the sofa with me, and she looked into my eyes, and she informed me that she had been diagnosed with cancer. If ever a teenage boy adored his mother, I was that teenage boy. Over the next two years, I watched her wither and finally die. And I can tell you, that the whole world felt different, and it has never felt the same since. Fast forward yet many more years. I don't know if you've ever experienced this, but one morning I woke up sobbing, crying, because I had just had a dream that my best friend, James Rafferty, had died. And in that moment, I knew something. These experiences and many others have convinced me 
that if there's one thing of which I am certain, it is that we human beings are psychologically, emotionally, and biologically engineered for relationships. The most beautiful thing, the most joyous thing that we can ever experience is to be in loving, trusting, faithful relationships. And the most painful and the most devastating thing that a human being can ever experience is to love somebody and to not be loved back, or to lose someone you love to death. We are made for relationships. Now, I'm going to suggest to you this evening that we're like this for a reason. Mentally, emotionally, our behavior patterns, the deepest longings that pulsate in our hearts, we're like this for a reason. We are made for relationships because our identities as human beings are traceable to a God whose very existence is defined by faithful relationship. Now, theologically, at the most basic level, you can go one of two directions. You can go in the direction of conceiving of God as a solitary self a rigid singularity. Or you can go in the direction of conceiving of God as a relational dynamic. And your theology on all levels will take its form and shape from one of those two foundational points. Either God is a solitary self, if you go back far enough in your reasoning, either God is a solitary self, in which case you would trace God's identity to sheer selfhood, to sheer power, to sheer aloneness. Or we trace God's identity back to a dynamic exchange of thoughts and feelings, a relationship that defines who God is. And in that theological perspective, you can say with coherence, God is love. God is love because love, by definition, is relational. It's not possible to experience love in isolation. If you go into the bathroom and never come out, you'll never experience any love. Even with a full-length mirror, that's called narcissism. If you want to experience love, you've got to come out of the bathroom and look into other people's eyes and receive from them and give in to them. Now, either God, in his ultimate reality, knows nothing about receiving and giving, or God, in his ultimate reality, is defined by receiving and giving. We could close with a prayer and an amen right there, and you get the whole point of where these two theological paradigms lead. Now, I'm, of course, here to favor and to try to persuade you to favor and to believe with all your heart that God ultimately is love. Not love in the weak, sentimental, insipid sense that Hollywood would have us think of the word love. Let's face it, the word love has been hijacked. But just because the devil steals God's vocabulary doesn't mean we shouldn't take it back. The Bible says God is love, but it doesn't mean something weak and sentimental. It's not like cotton candy. It's like quinoa tofu salad. It has substance. You know what I'm saying? It's nourishing. God's love isn't something wispy and weak. God's love is the most powerful force in the universe. It is other-centeredness in the most extreme and beautiful sense the human mind can imagine leading to Calvary, which wasn't weak 
and wispy and wimpy. What we see happening at the cross of Calvary is the ultimate act of self-giving love. And that act came out of God's identity. Again, either God is traceable to a solitary selfhood in which there is no love, or God's identity is traceable to a relational dynamic out of which God created us. And the reason why we just happen to be hyper-relational is because God is relational. Now, I'm going to suggest to you this evening that the whole of Scripture, the entire narrative, the whole story is built around this idea that God is love in the strong and beautiful and amazing sense that we're trying to understand it this evening. Let's pick up where we left off last night. We moved through the biblical narrative through much of the story as it occurs in the book of Genesis. We saw that there's this guy named Adam and a woman named Eve, and these two individuals at the beginning of the story define the image of God. So if God's image looks like a relational dynamic, God is a relational dynamic before the act of creation occurs. This relational dynamic between the man and the woman possesses the capacity for procreation and the building of social circles to fill the whole earth. Now, Adam and Eve, in their experience with one another and with God, are the beginning point of this story. But as we pointed out last evening, as Scripture, the story points out last evening, the fall occurred. Now, the fall of mankind, well, you could actually, for the sake of understanding it, you could call the fall the falling out of love because it was, in fact, a falling out of love. Human beings fell out of love with God and out of love with one another. And all the brokenness in our world is defined by an absence of or a violation of love. So here's the thing. Adam and Eve sin, and sin is a force now to be reckoned with in the world that fractures and tears people apart. But God promises, you remember, Genesis 3.15, God promises, I'm going to rectify the whole situation. Now, the way I'm going to rectify the situation in the first prophecy promise, Genesis 3.15, the way I'm going to rectify the promise is by coming into your situation. I'm going to enter into solidarity with the human race. I'm not going to stand at a distance and shout commands. I'm going to actually enter. I'm going to save the human race. Listen, I'm going to save the human race from the inside. I'm going to save the human race from the inside. I'm going to become one of you. And so God says to the serpent in the presence of the man and the woman, I will put enmity, hostility between you and the woman, between her seed, her offspring, and your offspring. There will be two lines down through history. And he, singular, a certain coming one, will crush your head, serpent, Satan, as you bruise his heel. This is the promise that all of Scripture is built upon straight through to the book of Revelation. It's all just a magnifying of this one promise, this one prophecy. Now, we moved on last evening and we came to an understanding that after Adam and Eve, God began to build his progeny plan to save humanity through an act of epic solidarity to become the brother of the human race. God did this by starting a line, a people. He called Abraham. And Abraham had a son named Isaac, who had a son named Jacob. Jacob had 12 sons. They collectively became the nation of Israel. Israel then is named in Scripture as God's begotten son. And as Israel takes on this corporate identity as God's son in the world, through Israel comes King David, and King David is called God's anointed, begotten son. 
And then comes Solomon, who is called God's begotten son. So there's a pattern to the story. And as the story unfolds, we need to back up now. We moved through much of Genesis. We got to Solomon. Now we back up to Abraham. So God said something really strange to Abraham in Genesis 15. He had told Abraham in chapter 12, in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Wink, nod. Messiah's coming through you, through your lineage, Abraham. Now, Abraham, I need to explain to you some of the ramifications of this. So we come to chapter 15, and in the most incredibly odd object lesson that we can conceive of, God comes to Abram and says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to take three animals, and here are the instructions. I want you to cut these three animals straight down the middle, top to bottom, and I want you to take the two halves, the two pieces, and I want you to lay them across one from another, across one from another, across one from another. Three animals. So now, in our imagination, we see what Abram could see. There is on the ground before this man, there is a path between a series of severed pieces. And then Abraham becomes tired. He's followed the instructions. And then this happens, verses 17 and 18. And it came to pass when the sun went down and it was dark. Now watch this. That behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a burning torch, some kind of fiery, blazing presence. And what did it do? It passed between those pieces, emerged on the other side. Abraham's watching the whole event. This fiery figure walks between the pieces and comes out the other side. An object lesson has just been communicated. And then the scripture says, the latter part of verse 18, on the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram. A covenant. Hold on to the word for a minute. Now what's happening here is something that is culturally understandable in Abraham's context, but we don't get it. In these times, if two individuals entered into an agreement, maybe to sell or purchase a piece of land, rather than going and having a contract drafted up and each signing with a pen, they had this ritual that they would go through. And the ritual was that the man selling the land and the man buying the land, they would sever an animal in two and create a symbolic path between them. And then each one entering into the agreement, the contract, the covenant, would pass between the pieces and emerge on the other side and look back at the other. And passing between the two pieces, symbolically, each one is saying, may it be done to me as is done to this animal sacrifice if I don't fulfill my part of the bargain. In other words, if I'm not good on my word, may I be sacrificed like this animal to my unfaithfulness. God tells Abram, in order to save you and to fulfill my promise to you back in Genesis chapter 12, in order to save you, something excruciating is going to have to occur. A sacrifice is going to have to happen. A severing is going to occur. But Abraham, unlike human contracts, you're not the one who will make the sacrifice. I will endure the severing for you and for the human race. And in that day, God made a covenant. Okay, now let's pan out and understand our words. What do we mean by covenant? This is one of the most significant, I'm pretty convinced, the most significant word in the narrative of Scripture. 
This single word has more explanatory power than any other word that I have discovered in my own personal study. It's not a word that's in vogue today. We don't use it a lot. But this word is a biblical word that has a lot of meaning. Now, track with the word because this is mind-blowing. If we can wrap our minds around this, we will be immensely blessed in our understanding of God's character, God's identity, God's love. Now, watch this. When the Bible employs the word covenant in that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham. When the scripture uses the word covenant, it means something. First of all, from Hosea chapter 6, verses 6 and 7. For, this is God speaking. For I desire, note the language, steadfast love. Everybody say steadfast love. That's what God wants. That's God's agenda. God said, okay, if I could tell you what I want from you as individuals and from you as a human race, it's steadfast love. That's what I'm after. That's what I'm going for. Love that is steadfast. No break in it. Relational integrity. That's what I'm looking for. For I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice. The knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. Now notice this. But like Adam, now what has God done? He's taken us back to the beginning of the narrative. But like Adam, they, that is all of Israel and the human race, they transgressed what? The covenant there, the covenant there they dealt faithlessly with me or without relational integrity, without trust. They broke the relationship. Notice in the text that steadfast love is equivalent to the word covenant, and covenant is equivalent to steadfast love. Now, notice what it says in Isaiah 54 and verse 10. Though the mountains be shaken and the hills be removed, yet, God says, my unfailing love for you will not be shaken, nor my what? Covenant of peace be removed, says the Lord who has compassion on you. So in this passage, what does covenant mean? Unfailing love. Love of a particular quality. Love that doesn't fail, that remains faithful. Check this out. Isaiah 55, verse 3. This is amazing. Give ear and come to me. Listen that you may live and I will make an everlasting what? Covenant with you. And now, my faithful love promised to David, who's a key character in the narrative, through whom Messiah will come. God is saying here over and over again, the covenant is faithful love. The covenant is unfailing love. The covenant is defined by love. Now watch this. The fall of mankind is defined by broken covenant. As we saw in Hosea 6, but look at this in Isaiah 24. The earth is also defiled under its inhabitants. In other words, human beings are living in such a way that the very ecosystem itself is being impacted. The earth is also defiled under its inhabitants because they have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinance, broken what? The everlasting covenant. Therefore, because the covenant is being broken, therefore the curse has devoured the earth and those who dwell in it are desolate. Listen, listen. Everything that is wrong with the world, and this is not hyperbole, I am not exaggerating for effect. Everything, according to Scripture, that is wrong with the world is due to broken covenant. Everything that is wrong with the world is, in other words, due to unfaithfulness in relationships. All the brokenness, all the damage, all the woundedness, all the hurt is due to people crossing relational lines to violate others or failing to render to others the faithfulness they are due. If you were to analyze your own experience as a human being, every trauma, every psychological weight, every discomfort in your emotional makeup is traceable to some other human being that violated you or to your own violations of some human being. 
The sin problem in this sense is defined as broken love, broken relationship, broken covenant. So covenant clearly in Scripture is defined as faithful love. The sin problem is defined as an absence of faithful love. Adam and Eve sinned, that is, they broke covenant with God, and the human race became a race of covenant breakers. That is to say, a race of individuals who violate one another. Now, it shouldn't surprise us then that when we fast forward in the story, in the narrative, that the Messiah who has been promised bears a title. He bears lots of titles in Scripture. But according to Daniel 11.22, the Jesus Christ, the Messiah who's coming, is bearing the title as he comes, according to Daniel, the Prince of the Covenant. Now, what does covenant mean again? Faithful love, unfailing love, steadfast love. Who is Jesus by his own prophetic identity? Who is Jesus? He is the prince of faithful love. He's the prince of steadfast love. He's the prince of unfailing love. He's the one who's coming into the world to show us what love looks like in action and to redeem our failure to love. So when we come to Isaiah chapter 42 and verse 6, just allow yourself to be floored and blown away by the beauty of this scripture. This is God, Yahweh, speaking. Actually, it's a song. This is God the Father singing to the Messiah before his incarnation. And the Father sings to the Messiah, anticipating the incarnation and the cross, the Father sings, I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness, and I will hold your hand. Why does your hand need to be held? Well, read the context. The implications are that when God becomes incarnate, it's going to be an ordeal. There's going to be suffering. There's going to be pain. There's going to be a severing. There's going to be a lot of suffering. And here, God is saying... When you go upon this mission to save them, I'll hold your hand through the entire ordeal. I will be with you through the entire painful trauma. But check this out. I will hold your hand. I will keep you. That is, I'll sustain you. I'll hold you together. And I will give you as a covenant to the people. Okay, so I will give you as a covenant to the people. Notice that Jesus is called the prince of the covenant, and Jesus is here said to be given to the human race as a covenant. He is the covenant of faithful love personified. This is who he is. This is his identity. This is what he's coming to the world for. But let's go back now to that prophecy that enacted symbolic prophecy in Genesis 15. Abraham severed the animals in two and laid them across one from another, forming a path between them. The animals were cut in two. There was a severing that occurred. And this is symbolizing for Abraham that in order to save the human race, God himself will have to, in order to follow through with faithfulness, covenant faithfulness will require God to follow through to himself, experience some kind of cutting, some kind of severing, some kind of relational separation will have to occur. And so... When we come again to the prophecies of Daniel, we see that there's a prophecy of the coming Messiah that's given. Seventy weeks are determined upon your people. The 70-week prophecy, it unfolds, and this is remarkable. When Jesus is brought to view in the prophecy, the coming Messiah, the Scripture says, and after 62 weeks, Messiah shall be I'm not going to work out the math here for you. That's a different study, a different subject, the 70-week prophecy. But this is pointing to 31 AD and the Calvary event. 
And what is Calvary defined as? After 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. Note the tenderness of the language. Note the other centeredness of the language. Messiah is going to be cut off, but not for himself. And if not for himself, then for who? For us. The severing, the sacrifice, the cutting is for us, for the human race. He will undergo, he will endure the most monumental fracture in a relationship that has ever occurred in all of universal history. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? A separation occurs in a relationship that has only ever known perfect, other-centered friendship. And now suddenly there's this darkness that interposes between. Suddenly, there is emotional distance. Suddenly, there is the feeling of being completely and utterly alone in the universe. Jesus, the prophecy said, would be cut off. In the narrative, a direct and deliberate reference back to the story of Abraham and the cutting of the animals in two. So now we come forward to the New Testament, and the Apostle Paul, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, who thinks in terms of the Old Testament narrative, he is biblically literate, he knows what he's talking about, and he's working out the implications of the incarnation and the sacrifice of Christ from the premise of the Old Testament story. In Philippians chapter 2, this is remarkable. Allow this to be remarkable to you. Sometimes you just need to shake off the stupor and be blown away. Just be amazed at what Scripture is teaching us here. Shake off the lethargy of pop culture and everything this world is forcing on us and just zone in right here, right now for a moment and contemplate the magnitude of the love of God for your soul. Here, the Apostle Paul says, let this mind, this attitude, this disposition be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, now the attitude, the mind, the disposition, the character, the identity is going to be defined for us. Who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself, it's a voluntary act, made himself, we didn't make him do it, nobody made him do it, made himself, of no reputation. Now, that's the King James Version. That's the New King James Version. And it's poetic, but it's weak on the translation. Made himself, the one who was equal with God, the one who was in very nature God, made himself of no reputation. It sounds like, like he has simply submitted to an external review where people have a bad opinion of him. No reputation. But that's not what the word means. The word here in the Greek is kenosis, from the root Greek word, kinoo. Kinosis is a word that means literally to be emptied of all your content. If you have a glass of water, you dump it out, kinosis occurred. So, for example, the NIV renders the one who was in very nature God made himself nothing. The ESV translates it, he emptied himself, the word kenosis. The Phillips translation says that he laid aside his personal prerogatives and advantages as the one who was equal with God. So think about it like this. To be God means something. It means that you have some content that makes up who you are. Well, we know that God's character content is love. God is love, and he can't ever be emptied of that. But there are attributes 
not character traits, but attributes that also make up God's content. Attributes that we're familiar with, omnipotence, omniscience, omnipresence. The word omni, of course, means all. Omnipotence is all-powerful. Omniscience is all-knowing, and omnipresence is all-present. So these are attributes that pertain to God and God alone. They don't pertain to any created beings. None of these attributes pertain to angels or to human beings. God alone possesses these attributes. When God in Christ becomes incarnate, just process with me the magnitude of the kenosis that he underwent. The kino process. Just imagine with me what it means to be omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, and to have the content of your divine rights as God emptied from you. Now watch this. Scripture testifies. Jesus himself in John chapter 5 verse 30 says to the disciples, they're witnessing all of his miracles. He's raising people from the dead. He's healing the sick. They're all awed by his power. And he says, hey, wait a minute. Let me just clarify something here. I can of myself do nothing. And then he deflects to the Father. All the miracles we see Jesus perform in this life, he is performing as the Son of God, or the brother of the human race. He is the one who has now come in the lineage of Adam and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and David and Solomon, and here he is, incarnate. And Jesus, when he is performing these miracles, is doing so not with his own personal omnipotence, but as a human being experiencing the omnipotence of the Father channeling through him. That's why the disciples and even Paul could heal the sick and raise the dead, and they weren't divine. But more explicit, in Acts chapter 2, verse 22, men of Israel, Peter preaches, men of Israel, listen, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles and wonders and signs, and here's the part, which God did through him. Which God did through him in your midst. So when you see Jesus doing signs and miracles and wonders, whose power is on display? His own personal power? No, he's a human being retaining the divine character and identity. God is love. But voluntarily saying, I'm going to put in remission, I guess we could say, voluntarily, my own personal omnipotence in order to get close to you, in order to really be with you and not transcend the experience. What about omniscience? Luke 2.52 explicitly says, of God in the flesh, Jesus, that the child increased in wisdom and stature. So he, stature refers to his biological, his body. He grew up. He moved through the entire process of growing up biologically. He grew in stature. But it says he grew in wisdom. How do you grow in wisdom if you know everything? You don't. Mary could teach him Isaiah 53. The one who inspired Isaiah 53 is now learning it. And even more explicitly, as an adult... In Mark 13, verse 32, Jesus says to the disciples, but of the day and the hour of the second coming, of that day and hour knows no one, not even the angels in heaven, no surprise there, not even the Son, <laughs> but only the Father. Jesus explicitly says, I'm not operating here and now with omniscience. I don't know the day or the hour of my second coming. The Father knows I don't. When you don't know things, you're not omniscient. John 20 and verse 17, after his resurrection, Mary throws her arms around him. He says, don't detain me because I have not yet what? Ascended to my Father. That's a time-space statement. I'm here with you, Mary. I need to be with the Father. I'm going to travel through whatever you know mechanisms 
I'm going to dematerialize physically and then rematerialize in the Father's presence, but I'll tell you what's not going on, Mary. I'm not right here with you and simultaneously there with him. I'm going to have to move through space to be with him. Jesus made a sacrifice so monumental it takes our breath away. And he, having made this sacrifice in the incarnation, did so in order to be the fulfillment of the covenant promise of steadfast, unfailing love and to demonstrate to us in real time, in a human life, what it looks like to be covenantally faithful and what it looks like to be God and to be covenantally faithful. Listen, listen, listen. In Jesus, what we see taking place is the reestablishment of omnidirectional love. In Christ, we see God perfectly loving humans. We see a human perfectly loving God, and we see a human perfectly loving fellow human beings. Jesus is loving, loving, loving in all directions. He's taking in the whole human race. He is the epicenter now, of covenant faithfulness. It's all fulfilled in him. He loves God perfectly. <laughs> he loves humanity perfectly. And he loves, on the horizontal level, every member of the human race. Covenant is fulfilled in Christ. Why? Because Christ is the fulfillment of the Adam, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Israel, David story. That's why. Jesus is now here in the world in his incarnation. He goes to Calvary's cross and he is severed from the Father in order to be for us the perfect covenantal sacrifice of steadfast love. Now, this isn't something that is taking place outside of the context of the New Testament part of the narrative. Everything that we're talking about so far is Old Testament story. The Old Testament has told us who the Messiah is going to be, what he's going to look like, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And we've just kind of scratched the surface with Paul's understanding of the incarnation and the sacrifice with the idea of the divine emptying or kenosis. But now we notice that when we come from the Old Testament and cross the bridge into the New Testament, the very first thing that we read when you open the New Testament are these words. Matthew 1, verse 1. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham, dot, dot, dot. There is a perfect connection between the Old Testament and the New Testament. One of the worst things that has ever occurred in Christian history is this idea that we should print millions and millions of New Testaments. That is something that could only be done within a dispensationalist theology. The whole script is like giving somebody half the story. You don't take, you don't take Pride and Prejudice, break it in half, and hand the second half to some human being. I'm not recommending that book. I'm just making a point. It's a story. And you don't know who this guy is, Jesus, in the New Testament, unless you know who Abraham is, unless you know who David is, unless you know who Adam is. You have to know the story in order for the New Testament to make sense. So Jesus comes into the world, and the opening of the Second Testament tells us exactly who he is. The sonship of Christ is defined by the narrative that he is living out. Matthew knows nothing about trying to inform us about his metaphysical, ontological origins somewhat time way back in eternity past when the Father gave birth to the Son. Never happened. And Scripture knows nothing of this concept. What Scripture knows is that Jesus is the narrative Son of God. Jesus is the covenant Son of God. Jesus is God's love perfectly personified in a human life. So as Matthew's gospel unfolds, watch this. 
Now, you have to have been here last night for this to make sense. So Matthew 2.15, we're just told in chapter 1, verse 1, this is the son of David who's now arrived. This is the son of Abraham that's arrived. Then in chapter 2, verse 15, Exodus is quoted deliberately, specifically, and now the father says in Matthew's gospel, out of Egypt I've called my son. But this time it's referring to who? Jesus, the Messiah. Jesus, the Messiah, is now called out of Egypt, where his mother, Mary, and his father, Jacob, uh, Joseph, took him to escape from Herod's slaughter. Jesus fulfills the prophecy of Exodus. The Old Testament son called out of Egypt is Israel. Jesus is now, listen, Jesus is the complete faithful reenactment of Israel. He is the new Israel in himself. It is not by mistake that he proceeds in his ministry to literally mimic the Old Testament story by being baptized as a reference to the children of Israel marching through the Red Sea, by calling 12, not 13, not 11, 12 disciples because he's remaking Israel. It's not by mistake that Jesus ascends a little mountain and teaches and reframes the law as Israel encountered Yahweh at Sinai. It's not by mistake that Jesus is literally reenacting Israel's history with faithfulness. All their failures are redeemed in him. Jesus is Israel. He is the Son of God in the Israelite sense, in the Davidic sense. Jesus is the Son of God called out of Egypt. That's chapter 2. Chapter 3, and suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. The Father himself is engaged in the reenactment of the history. The Old Testament is now being completely reenacted in Christ. Then we come to the Gospel of Luke. And in the Gospel of Luke, we have the same basic pattern. He has helped, speaking of the coming Messiah, he has helped his servant Israel. Notice, when Jesus comes, he's here to help who? Israel, in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his seed forever. Jesus is here, according to Luke, to answer to the Old Testament narrative, to perform the mercy promise to our fathers and to remember his holy what? Covenant, the oath which he swore to our father Abraham. Luke explicitly tells us that Jesus is now here to remember, to fulfill the covenant promise that the whole Old Testament is about. When you see this, the New Testament comes alive. And now everything makes sense in this context. Luke goes on in chapter 3, verses 21, 22. When all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also was baptized. And while he prayed, the heavens opened and the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him. And the voice, a voice came from heaven which said, you're the one that the whole story was foretelling. You're my beloved son and in you I'm pleased. The idea here is that God called Adam to be his faithful son, and Adam forfeited faithfulness. God called Israel to be God's faithful son, and Israel forfeited faithfulness. God was not pleased. God looks at Jesus and says, finally, 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 my one true covenant son who will fulfill all the terms and ramifications of the covenant. And then we come to the Gospel of John, which I can't cover in two minutes and 37 seconds. And so we're going to pick up there tomorrow night. But in the Gospel of John, just to, just to put it on the tip of your frontal lobe, the most significant an oft-quoted scripture, John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten 
Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. John's gospel is a complete rewrite of Adam and Israel's history in the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. The New Testament knows nothing about trying to explain to us that long, long ago, before anything was ever made, God, the singular, solitary self, gave birth to another God. And it's Jesus. The Bible doesn't know that story. That comes from Plato and Aristotle and down through the ages. What the Scripture knows is that Jesus is God's faithful covenant son. Why? Because we as human beings, we were made in the image of God, which means we were made only ever to experience faithful relationships, unbroken love, integrity in all of our interactions. Psychologically and emotionally, you and I were not built to be violated. We can't sustain the pain and the wounds of loving and not being loved back. We're not built for it. The moment we have a bad relationship, even our immune system is depressed because biologically we can't handle it. God is love, and everyone who lives in love lives in God, and God in them. Father in heaven, you are incredible, and we love you. Thank you for loving us first. Thank you for your love superseding our failure. Thank you for rewriting our history in Christ, the second Adam, the new Israel.